Hello, I'm People's Historian Daniel Gray, and today I'm going to tell you the tale of Edinburgh's female suffrage movement. In the whole of Edinburgh, there are only two statues of women. There are more of animals than half of humankind. It's an embarrassment. In the buildings around us was once the Elsie Ingalls Maternity Hospital. Thousands of Edinburgh babies were born here, including my own wife. But Elsie Ingalls wasn't only a medical pioneer. She was one of a generation of Edinburgh women who had grown angry at the corset-like restrictions placed on them by male-dominated society. Like many in the Edinburgh suffrage movement, Elsie was from a middle-class family. She was one of the first women to study medicine at Edinburgh University. Once graduated, she took her principles and put them into practice. This meant giving free health care to the poor, starting up a hospital for poor mums and their children. She joined the National Union of Women's Suffrage Society, or Suffragettes, and became a key figure in Edinburgh. She found the energy to tour Scotland. She was a great orator. Yet despite the work of Elsie, Crystal and their friends in the suffragist movement, it wasn't quite enough for some. It was time for more radical solutions. The cause of votes for women was spreading infectiously through Edinburgh. It had started off as a middle-class crusade but was now becoming a mass movement. A march was held which began in Holyrood Park and covered Princess Street in people. The point was to show that women had been great, were great and could be even greater given the chance. And yet it wasn't quite enough for some of those in the suffragette movement. They felt that the boat should be rocked and even forced to capsize. By 1909, the same time as the procession through Edinburgh, Suffragettes across Britain had been thrown into prison for their actions. They were now, though, being force-fed, an action that inflamed things even further. Behaviour became more militant. Power lines were cut, windows were smashed, and a knife taken to the portrait of the King in the Royal Gallery. In 1912, Edinburgh suffragettes began to pour flammable liquids into post boxes and set them alight. It took things up a notch. Out came the bombs in Edinburgh. At 1am on May the 21st, 1913, here at the observatory, a woman emerged from the shadows of the bushes. In her hand was a homemade bomb, a clay vessel stacked with gunpowder. She walked up to the observatory, placed it at the foot of the wall, lit it and ran. An almighty explosion erupted. Inside, wooden timbers split, glass windows smashed, cracks appeared in the brickwork of the West Tower. In the bushes the next morning, they found a handbag with some currant biscuits inside it and a piece of paper, a scrawled note which read, How beggarly appears argument before defiant deed. Votes for women. No one was ever caught. Actions had begun to speak louder than words among the angry suffragettes of Edinburgh. We'll never know just how far Edinburgh's militant suffragettes, these banditas, would have gone. That's because when World War I started, all women's suffrage groups agreed to a truce. But the momentum was with them, and by 1928, they had the vote on the same terms as men at long last. The story of Edinburgh's suffrage pioneeresses presents us many candidates for statues. I'd like my own daughter to grow up in a city that salutes its women that change the world. <laughs>